these organizations. So we want to protect against all these things and we want to get rid of as many organizations and, um, and, and, and technical uh, problems in the middle. Um, so we need to do two things. One is the, we need to protect the integrity of the data so that nobody actually changes it. And we need to make sure that it actually comes from the person who is supposed to tell it to us. If we look, take a closer look again at the uh, at, at the path, um, we're, we're first first we're talking to the DHCP server. We turn on our, our, our laptop, we talk to the DHCP server who gives us answers. So that's our first vulnerability. Um, DNSSEC isn't really um, meant to, to fix that. There are people who are doing MAC, th uh, MAC address things on, on a local loopback uh, to protect that part. Um, if you could at some point start verifying things with additional options in the DHCP server. But right now, that's, that's, it still assumes that that's a secure connection. The second one, it's, um, you have to, once, once the DHCP server gives you your IP address and your name servers and everything, and assuming that's all trusted, you actually need to talk to those name servers. Uh, I don't see any other way of securing that than running it yourself. Like running a caching name server on your own machine that does all the queries, so that you can verify all the DNSSEC extensions. As soon as you talk to a secure resolver elsewhere, your connection to that resolver is still unencrypted, unsecure. So, so we come to yeah, the resolver itself, um, communication to the net. Then there are some problems where, uh, further down, which of course is the ones that we're actually trying to address. Name server, name server communication, uh, all the other networks. Uh, and all the records served by other people. 
so I want to talk about this. So two important things actually between between name servers and actually name servers and clients are the zone transfers and the dynamic updates. And the zone transfers can be easily secured. The dynamic update is a bit more difficult because every single person will have their own key and they will need to actually somehow secure it and then you need to put that into a zone and we'll see how that becomes really complicated because we are um, doing things like sorting the zone before assigning it. Um, protecting the zone files itself and the caches, we'll see how the cryptography will help us there. So, there's TSIG and SIG0, which are ways to secure name server to name server communication. Um, we don't use it, frankly, because we trust our path between the two name servers. We use an IPsec tunnel between them, or we use SCP to copy the files uh, to, the, to the slave. So we don't really need to secure the transfer, the AXFR itself. Um, and, of course, because we're serving all the, the zones signed, even if that transfer is plain text, and even if someone would change it, then the signature is wrong at the slave. So you would still find out that someone has been messing with your data. So to me, this doesn't sound too important to secure, um, except that um, we need this for the dynamic updates, because you connect with your laptop, you want to say what your host name is, or you want to allow uh, relay for mail or whatever. So, you, so for the HTTP client, this is very useful. And then there are two systems, t which is a pre-shared key system, you just agree a secret and you start to communicate, or you use 60, which is a real public key system. So using 60 um, is hopefully is what's going to take off. So this is the, the essence of DNSSEC, basically. We have four new records, and that's, that's what we need to get everything done. The key record, which is the public key that we use for signing things, that we also need to publish, because otherwise you cannot check the signatures. The actual signatures over the data. The next record, which we use for the analytic systems, which I'll come back to. And the DS record, which is the most controversial uh, record, because that's used for building a chain between the different name servers that basically have nothing to say about each other's zone. And there's a new flag in the, in the answer if you, in the answer section if you're interested. So you can see that the, uh, that the data was actually secured and was, was verified to be secure. But it's not protected by signature. So if you talk to a, to a resolver and it says, well, the AD is flag is sad, everything is secure. Well, yeah, still someone else could have just flipped a bit. So it's nice for debugging, but it's no security. So this is the actual key record. Um, for people familiar with DNS, I, I hope people are familiar with DNS, otherwise um, this might be a bit complex. Um, we've got the label, the TTL, the IN for internet, the key is the name, and we've got flags, protocol, algorithm, key material. Flags, um, will, and in this case we'll just use authentication and confidentiality, and that's like, added up together, 256 bits. Um, then in this case we have this key that you see here for free one and now is a DNS set key, so it has protocol 3, and the algorithm we use this RSA SHA-1. And then we've got the key material and the key IDs for us humans to be able to sort of figure out where all our keys are going. And by the way, if anyone has questions, just please interrupt me. So this is what it's really all about. We have the key in our zone, and now we're going to sign with that key. So we've got again the label. In this case here, I'm showing two NS records for freeze one and L, and the signature over it. Um, one, one reason for um, 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 uh, putting these together is that we want to, the, the zone is going to explode with new records. We've got key records, we have sick records. And people are very signed, are really upset when you add one record per domain in their zone. Their servers are not very happy <laughs> if you add things. Um, so one of the optimizations is that since we're also always serving out all the records of the same type, in this, in this case the NS records, we just do one signature over the entire set. So if all the name server records have one signature, all the key records have one signature, per label of course, if it's a different label then it gets a different signature. 
And again, we can see the original TTL is in there. There's a signature exp expiration date, which is important, and a signature inception date. Um, this means that NTP now becomes really, really important. <laughs> if even your client, and if you're running the security resource on your laptop, and your laptop has the wrong time, then it might not work. Now, in this case, we're still talking about, usually these things are signed for a month, so you're fine. But there is, there is actually some, uh, some danger that, you know, if you're an hour off, then the signature might not yet be valid, or it might just have expired if you're an hour late. The key tag is again for the humans, and then there's the key material. Sorry, the key material, the signature. <laughs> then, we have a next record. Why, why do we need a next record? The problem is, is we cannot just say, like if someone's asking for adc.freeswan.nl, we just cannot say, well, it doesn't exist. We need to somehow sign our answer and saying this really doesn't exist and here's the signature proving that nobody's lying. So what we did was they came up with the next record which basically points to the next record in the list, in the zone, in the, sorry, the next label, which means that first of all we have to sort our zones before signing. So we start signing our zones. So we can see here it starts with the apex. So free swan and L is the first record. So we get all the free swan and L records. Then the next sorted, alphabetically sorted record is in this case active or read of phase one that now. So what we do is we make one record that points that says the next record you will expect is active or read of phase one that now. And then afterwards it lists all the records that are, for, that are currently, uh, that's currently defined for the current uh, uh, label. So phase one and now has an NS, a SOA, an NX, a SIG, a key, and a next record. And the next entry in the zone is active only that freeze one of now. Now if it would be asking like give us the whatever information, give us the A record on ADC that freeze one dot now, we would get this next record back. Basically telling us, you know, the previous record is that, the next record is that, yours is not in there. And of course, this next record can be signed, so we get a signed record back saying, you know, your data really isn't here, it doesn't exist. Again, very time is very upset with this because this means <laughs> there are lots of new records for them. So um, they first came with an optimization called opt-in, which basically said, well, let's just point to the next secure record. Because if you're very sign and you're on the top level domain, you just don't want to put a next record to you know the next domain. You, you go from a.com to b.com, and if b is not secure, well, there's no, no, no point in pointing to b.com because it's insecure anyway. So they propose, like, let's point to the first secure one. So let's say that D.com is the first secure one, then the, record for, the next record for A.com would point to D and would skip B and C. Because, you know, people aren't interested in that anyway if you're doing secure resolving. So uh, that actually gives very a few more years to slowly get bigger machines actually get, by the time that everything is, is secured by DNSSEC, to actually hold the entire zone. And then there's yet another problem with the next zones, uh, with the DS records that they fixed. Um, that's basically said, well, let's ditch this whole plan, let's ditch the next record thing, and just say, you know, the next is elsewhere, and just not point to a, a next record, and not sort alphabetically. But that's very experimental, that's from the last couple of weeks, and uh, there's only unreleased snapshot code from IETF, so I haven't seen it. And uh, I don't know much about it. Uh, the only problem is that if this system and the old system are going to work together, then we need to differentiate them, which basically means that you need to know if a key record belongs to the older or the newer system. So they come up with key two and SIG two records. So to recap, this is the very limited freeze one in our zone. It just got the Apex and a name server record, an A record, and an X record. Now if we get the secured, then we'll see, I hope it's somewhat readable. Um, <laughs> first of all, we see that on the previous slide we had the www record before the middle and X record. Uh, here it has been sorted, and you can see there's a SOA record and the signature of the SOA record. 
There's uh, two name surf records, one signature over name surf record. Um, there's one MX, signature over the MX. There are two keys, and you see the two signatures. I'll explain that later. Actually, two, the, two, the set of two keys has, has been assigned twice with two different keys here. We'll see the next one, the next record, which is signed, and then it switches to the next label, and then the whole story repeats again. Okay, so now we'll get to the point of delegation. Now we've got one secure zone, it's really good. But now how do we get to this zone? Because our parent does not have our key. Our parent cannot sign anything, and we do not want to give the parent some data that might later be obsolete, or we need to continuously check the data on, uh, with the parent to see if they still have the, our latest key record. So the parent cannot sign anything for, for the child, but it has to point to the child. So we have to have some way of securely pointing to the child, because if the parent just points into nowhere, and then we go someplace else and we get new key records, and we have no clue whether or not those key records are in fact the real key records of the zone. So basically, um, we, in, 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 just like the, the previous solution to give some glue when needed, we're now giving some cryptographic glue when needed. So we get the DS record. The, uh, the DS record basically says this is a hash of the key of the child zone. So, and then it gives the normal glue or the normal name server records. And so when, once you get to the child, you ask for the key record, you check the hash, and then you know whether or not you've been sent to the right place. And of course, this hash has been signed by the key of the parent. So if you trust the parent's key, you trust the hash. So you ask for the key of the child, you check the hash of that key. If they match, you trust the key of the hash. Do you trust the uh, key of the child? And we've moved one step down. Did this make any sense? I'll show it in a, in a, in a, in a diagram there. And, and of course the DS uh, record is signed, as you can see there. So in the ideal world, we only need one, only very sign, or I can need to have one key, and then from there on we'll go trust everything. Um, in the real world already, because I know it's the first experiment that's actually rolled out anything that you can work with, at this moment, um, we already have like a key entry point that's different from the root. And that's how things will be in practice as well. We've got secure entry points where you say this key belongs to this zone and everything below it will be securely uh, resolved. There's another problem we have is, of course, if there's only one key, um, there's quite some communication going on. If every month I want to change my key because, you know, uh, large keys are strong but are CPU intensive so we want to have like small keys that we can reasonably quickly deal with. Um, keys can be stolen, um, they can be bad. Uh, once in a while it's good to replace your key but you don't want to keep talking to the parent every 30 days uh, in, in, in some sort of out of bound message transfer. So we want to do this inbound as well. That's where um, there's actually a two key set up. So now we have, we're going to make two keys per zone, and that's actually what you saw on the previous slide. One is the zone signing key, which we use to sign our zone. And one is the key signing key, which we use to only sign the key records in that zone. So for the free zone and L zone, we put in two keys, the zone signing key and the key signing key. The key signing key signs the two keys in one go. Then the zone signing key signs the entire zone. Now, the DS record from the parent can only point to one key, and it points to the key signing key. Now, the key signing key we can make very strong. We can keep for, say, a year. And then we can cycle our zone signing key ourselves without, without telling the parent, because our key signing key is still signed by the parent. And the key signing key signs the zone signing key in our zone, so we follow the path of trust there. So we add one key, but thereby we can roll over our own zone keys very quickly if we want to. So I've tried to actually put this in, in, 
in a slide. It, 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 it's fairly tricky to do, and there's, there's now software that helps you, but every, every couple of months someone figures out that there's a, there's a, a problem with the key rollover, and people haven't thought about you know, key, keys that are still out there and still have a TTL for a couple of days, or, or, or other problems. Or, it's, it's, it's a pretty complex matter. Um, so the current system more or less is like normal situation, when you, when you have your keys, you have two keys, the key signing key, zone signing key. Now, if you want to roll over your zone signing key for a new one every month, you basically, at the parent, you see nothing changes because we still keep the key signing key and we still have a DS over the key signing key. On the child, what you do is you add the second, the second key. So from normal to prepare, you see that we've added the second zone signing key and we already sign it. We make sure that the key signing key signs both the old and the new zone signing key so that if people end up, end up somewhere with some of old data or cache data, it still works. Once we've run this for at least TTL time, but maybe, maybe a day or longer, we can then remove the old key and then we only have the key signing key and the new zone signing key. signing key also needs to be rolled over after a while, so after a year, depending on how strong you make it. That's a bit more complex because now you see that the DS record has to change. Um, so we are adding a new key signing key, case K2. We sign still with case K1 because that's where the DS records point to. We cannot sign the keys with something else. Uh, so the signing key doesn't change at all. Then once we have everything signed with the key signing key, with the new one, uh, let's see, um, this is actually wrong. I know, the key signing key, the first key signing key signs everything. Then when you switch, you switch with key signing key two and the DS at the same time. And then it doesn't matter what, what, what case K runs out, as long as you keep it in for a while for the cash records. And if your key is stolen, then you really have a problem. Um, if, you, if you deploy DNS, you better have a procedure ready for what happens when your key is lost or stolen, because you will be in a panic. You need to inform everyone who's using your key as a secure entry point uh, to tell them to change keys. Um, it, it would be a good thing if you have a spare key in your zone signed already so that you can instantly switch without needing to wait for the TTL to expire. Um, if you don't have that, well, what are you going to do for the time that TTL still lives? There's still signed data out there that might be wrong or made by someone else. Uh, it's a good thing to have a spare key signing key somewhere that uh, if, it, if it's needed, if you're compromised, you can instantly switch. But it's already difficult enough as it is right now with just the regular keys to start adding keys as well. Okay, now the practical side. Um, to do all this yourself, basically first you need to install the latest bind snapshot, which is very unstable, which you should not put on your DNS server. You should only put it on your signing machine, which is of course a very secure machine. You configure with OpenSSL, um, for Linux, at least you have to disable threads because they broke it. Um, there are things to know that you should already not be using. Host and MS Lookup should already be programmed, you should not be using anymore. If you really like the host output compared to the whole dig output like me, you can put plus DNS, uh, you can put plus multi-line in your dig RC. SFD, yeah. I think that's only in the snapshot code, yeah. And then you get a real nice output which I'll show in a second. Um, if you want to do DNSSEC queries, then you add plus DNSSEC for dig as well. So your sign on machine should be the bleeding edge bind. Your name server can be just a stable bind 8 or bind 9. So the, the stable binds are perfectly able to serve DNSSEC records. They are just not able to properly sign. But that's okay because name servers are not signing machines. Name servers just serve our data. And even if, if a name server gets compromised, even in the DNSSEC world, it doesn't matter, but it matters, but it cannot send out false data because people will reject the data because it's not properly signed. So this 
set of commands to actually create, if you do this manually, which I recommend against, but just for playing, uh, to, to do one or two zones. The NSIP gen, you can select the algorithm, you select the bit size, you select the zone for which it is. You get a key file. Um, in this case, we generate two, because one we use for the key signing key and one for the zone signing key. Um, we get two key records. And two, uh, two key files and two private files. The private files are the private keys. Do not put them in the DNS. The key files are the public keys. You want to put them in the DNS. Uh, they are nicely formatted, so you can just concatenate them to your current zone. Increase the serial number, and you can then use DNS sex sign zone to actually sign uh, the zone. And then you upload it, to, upload it to your main server and restart, and you can test it. I'll demonstrate a sec break after, after this. So this is what you see when you run dig. You can see on the top line, hopefully you can read the command line, uh, plus dig plus dnsec plus multi-line minus t a, so a record www.fml.nl and add, and then we use a secure resource from the Dutch NIC. We can see that we get back an a record with the IP number, a signature, and in this case, you can see the AD bit I've tried to circle around it that says that it's authenticated data. So this is how a typical query would look from big if you do a DNS query. I mean, the problem with very sign is that um, they're still using an old setup with code that is no longer in the latest bind snapshot because people will figure that it was wrong and moved on. But Verisign hasn't updated the experiment yet to to use the, the new DS record. So it's, yeah, I haven't used it yet. I'm, I'm hoping that they're actually updated that I don't need to figure out um, how the old system works. I mean, bind, the latest bind snapshot no longer supports it. If you want to deploy many zones, um, there have been some tools written by people. Um, there's some Pro tools in C, and there's DMSEC main to DMSEC main zone from Ola from Black MCC, um, which he's about to release, um, but you should be able to get it from his website any day now. Um, and I'll, dem I'll demonstrate how you can do many keys, but basically you can see the, uh, there's a shell uh, prompt from within a uh, tool that Olaf Goldman from Black made. I can easily create a zone, keep the zones and the keys in separate files, combine and sign as needed, and then do easy rollovers without actually having to edit the zone file and, and, and do all these things. Be careful if you're using bind8 name servers for this, because if your signature, that's, that's a new thing, right? The signature has an expiration date. If the signature expires, then the DNS data is invalid. The difference between bind 8 and bind 9 is that bind 8 then is so clever that it removes the data from your zone. While bind 9 says, well, you know, you, you better check the signature is invalid, I'm just serving the zone. So if you're just messing around a little bit, try it out, generate a key for 30 days, put it on your bind 8 server, forget about it, 30 days later your zone will be empty. So either use a stable bind 9 or better be sure that you update your signatures before they expire. Some changes in the organization that you'll be facing is the nice, easy way of whatever, manually editing your zone file or putting records through MySQL databases and uh, in your name server suddenly vanishes. You know, not, not 100 people can either just add a new record for a customer um, because this is now the responsibility of a very secure signing machine. Um, yeah, if you, if, you give, if you give 100 people access to your signing machine, the whole point of the NSSEC becomes rather moot. So it should be a really secure machine. Um, but you will be depending on it as well, so you better be sure that, you, that, that, that it works. And for instance, two days ago, so I, was, I was preparing the last things on these slides, and the NSSEC signing machine was in someone's car on the road driving to Amsterdam. <laughs> You're stuck. You cannot sign. You cannot do anything. You cannot change your own DNS data anymore. So you better be sure that you one have a copy of everything securely and make sure that the machine is reachable. Applications for DNS set. I hope I'll, I'll be able to show it now. Um, uh, there is finally a first real world application. Um, FreeSwan, the IPsec uh, stack for Linux. 
now has DNSSEC support, which means it can it can set up an IPsec tunnel based on a DNS name, a DNS key record. Um, I'll show that after this bit. Um, another cool application for DNSSEC, of course, is, is to store things securely. That's why everyone wants to use DNSSEC. DNSSEC itself is not a public key infrastructure, but the things that, that you can put in, you can actually use to create a public key infrastructure. <laughs> like, well, there, there's, there, there's been a patch for OpenSSH to actually uh, get key records from DNS, from DNSSEC to you know, get past the known host. Are you sure you want to connect to this host uh, thing? Uh, the DH client um, will soon support things as well because it needs to do dynamic updates, it needs to do it securely, and again, this is important for people who want to say, you know, phone home, say where they are, and actually put some DNS records in there to uh, to point people to their current mobile location. And because of the next record, um, normally these all these big zones like .com are, are sort of like secret, like nobody's supposed to know the whole zone for whatever marketing or security reasons. Um, with DNSSEC, of course, you can just ask for for the first record and start walking the whole zone. Uh, but people tend to see that because DNSSEC is not yet widely uh, deployed. I put all the references here um, together. Um, they're, they're in the slide book, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip that right now. I'll just do a, a demo further on. Um, like I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm interested in DNSSEC because I want to do IPsec based on opportunistic encryption. Um, the goal is to have host to host encryption for everyone using IPsec where we get the key material for the IPsec tunnel in the DNS in a secure way. So I'll first demonstrate the Dutch uh, system. Yeah. So this is the, the web interface of the secure registry of uh, MicML. Um, basically what you can do is you can ask for the status of a domain, and I removed one so that I could actually show it. Let's see if I still have my GPS connection. There we go. It says that one's not secure. If I, for instance, go to um, ask. For this one on all, you will see that the way they've set it up is that Nick and I uses a separate security contact, which is responsible for all the key exchanges, the outbound key exchanges on the first exchange. Um, okay. Now, to secure a domain in, in, in the Dutch registry, um, first of all, of course, you have to set up the two keys, your zone signing key and your key signing key. And then you can actually go to make secure. Of course, people will notice that this is not a secure HTTP connection. <laughs> Surfer, and then it sees that there are two keys. Um, the small one is the zone signing key, the larger one is the uh, key signing key. So basically, put it in. Of course, this procedure is somewhat insecure. Anyone can spoof these connections to these keys because right now we're not using DNS tag. But since Nick and L has a fairly insecure procedure to begin with anyway, this was actually decreasing the security at, at this point. Um, we are moving to PGP authentication where you can actually get with PGP in a later stadium. So now mail has been sent, uh, the, the uh, next reload, they will have a DS record published in the parent zone pointing to the... So that's a fairly nice system. Uh, and there's some inverted tool that shows it somewhat nice. We can so 
you see here, um, we have a secure www.freesound.nl, and I have configured a, a trusted key, so a secure entry point for .nl. So it gets keys, and actually it sees that there are three keys in the NL zone, not one. Um, it only trusts the 6869 key because that's the one that's trusted. Um, but because that one signed all the other keys, it now trusts all the keys in there. There's also a DS record there uh, that's been signed by that key, so it trusts the hash. Then we'll, uh, we'll go down. We get to, uh, let's see. to get to the zone where the, the free sign and L zone where there are two keys. One of them is the zone signing key, the other is the key signing key. Um, they see that this one is trusted through the DS record um, and that actually signs the other key. So now both keys become trusted. And since the second key, is, which is the zone signing key, is trusted, the signature on this record is actually trusted and therefore we are secure. With the tools that Olaf wrote from Vibe, we can also um, write some, some simple shell script around it, which I did here, which you can see the first part updates the serial numbers, the second part signs the zone and works around some bugs. And I'll demonstrate it so it gives you an idea of how, how quickly or how slow this actually runs. Um, this is, it's now going to sign, this is a signing machine, it's now going to sign 150 zones on a Pentium 3, 800, I think, or 700. And you see that, apart from the bug in one of the core modules for long records, you'll see that, you know, it takes a few seconds per zone. Um, so this is, this takes quite a while. So NL, the, the NL zone takes about four hours to sign. Also, if you do this on a laptop in a train, then you actually run out of random before you run out of battery, I noticed. Okay, um, well then, the only thing I have to sh I have left to show is the actual implementation of first one that's using DNSSEC. As you can see, it's a very new box. As anyone can see, it's a Red Hat box. Now, what you see is the, the plain penguin. There's no secure penguin here, uh, because right now, I do not have IPsec enabled on my laptop, which means that I'm not talking to that machine the machine tries to do, set up an opportunistic encryption-based IP sector to me, therefore queries the DNS for the IP number here, it doesn't find any records it can use, falls back to plain text mode, and this gives me plain text connection. Because I'm now dialed in with a, a GPRS to a local ISP, I have no clue what IP number I have, I have no control of my reverse zone, it's not secure, there's nothing I can do with it there. What the FreeSound project did was um, they trick uh, the vendor ID code to actually send, uh, sorry, they trick the ID um, that you can give in an IPsec connection to use a fully qualified domain name, which you can then look up in the DNS, and of course in the DNS secure zone. So what I'll do now is I'll set up, I'll start the, uh, my opportunistic encryption. And I'll have to trigger the server to talk to me so that you can see how long it takes. Now it takes a bit longer because now my laptop is actually um, looking for DNS records on the remote and for the, for the machine untappable. It sees that untappable advertises in its reverse DNS that, you know, I can do encryption, this is my key. Now I just need to tell Untappable who I am because I don't have a key in my reverse. I once I've told the 
notes here for who I am, then it can look it up in a DNS and that's secure and can actually use it. See now I have a connection. So now if I Just put some debug info on that port. We can see that uh, it found my DNS identity um, at via.xdnet and now um, it did set up a tunnel, which I can, can show here. It's this, this connection. I have an IPsec tunnel. However, on top of it, it's telling me at this point that it couldn't establish a DNS set identity for me. So even though it's signing up based on a DNS record and the key I published in the DNS, it's doing so with notes, you know, this is not really secure, this could be someone else. That's because currently untappable XDNetML does not trust the DNS set of XDNetML because it wasn't configured with that key. Now I will change that key to another one. Starting the Opportunist encryption bit, and I will ping again. And this time, my laptop will actually initiate an opportunistic encryption to the other side again, just just like before, because it still sees that the DNS is there. Um, but now, the other end should see that I'm coming from DNSSEC. This sometimes in the beginning fails actually is that um, my laptop is doing some DNS requests which in itself trigger the mechanism to see if we can do opportunist encryption to the main server for which it will first do a DNS request which of course fails because we're still not connecting to the main server so this only happens when you actually start up and you're not running your main server you haven't put your main server in the clear there Now resolved, now it's doing the IPsec negotiation. And it seems to be networking. <laughs>